Okay, welcome, 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 everyone. We are doing a Facebook Live with Stephanie Chan. I'm Rina Yukovsky. Most of you know me from now, by now. Excuse me. Sorry, my throat. <clears> throat> um, welcome, welcome, welcome. If you are joining us live, please type live, hashtag live in the comments or tell us where you're from. It's always fun to see people from all over the world on these lives because we usually have people from all over the world. Um, I'm actually in Israel and Stephanie is joining us from Canada. Um, which part of Canada, Stephanie? I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia. Vancouver. So welcome, Stephanie. Stephanie is going to tell you exactly what she does, but she has a lot of experience. It's, she has a website is MyCareBase, right? It's called MyCareBase.com. And mm-hmm. um, we know that for a lot of caregivers, family caregivers, it's a real issue when it comes to caregiving, figuring out who, how, when, why to hire caregivers. It's a real challenge because sometimes people don't want to give over the roles or they don't trust other people to do the caring. Um, We always think we can do it better, which might be true, but sometimes we get overloaded and burnt out and we have to know when and how and where to find quality caregivers to help us sometimes caring for our aging parents or grandparents or loved ones. So um, without further ado, Stephanie, thank you for joining us. And tell us a little bit about what you do and how you got into this and how sure. you help people. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Rena. Um, so how I got into this, I actually have an interesting origin story. I left completely different career um, in my 30s to start up a business. So I used to be a lawyer. I decided it wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I found a passion around helping individuals rather than companies. And so um, I realized in my 30s that what really drives me is um, helping people directly where I'm making an impact, even for a short moment in their lives. And so um, I found this kind of niche in helping seniors and family caregivers navigate our healthcare system here and find solutions and then trying to help them implement those solutions. And so in the last 16 years, I've started two companies um, to do with healthcare navigation, care planning, transition planning, and my newer business, my care base helps them find caregivers for, to help them age in place. Amazing. Wow. Wow. I love that. You really, you did a lot of different things. (laughs) Yeah. Even, even though, even though both your businesses are focused on the same type of thing, right? Yeah. Same audience. Right. Exactly. Same audience. Right. So um, I guess, how do you help people? Like, what do you, what do you find is the challenge and that you're trying to help people overcome or solution mm-hmm. that you're trying to solve yeah. for people? Um, generally two things. A lot of clients come to us um, when they are in a kind of a approaching burnout or already burnt out. So caregiver yeah. burnout is one thing I really want to help with yeah. and finding solutions for um, optimizing quality of life for the senior that they're taking care of. The other area where I really like to help is um, bridging the informational gaps. Mm, so yeah. in our healthcare system, and I think this is systemic in, in many countries, no matter where you live, there are informational challenges with regards to finding the services that best suit your needs. And here in Canada, we have um, a dual layer of healthcare that's provided by the government and then private pay services. And again, I think other countries have a similar system. And so it increases the fragmentation of information because there isn't an easy place for people to get all the information they need to make informed decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And is it, um, I know you're, you're probably very familiar with um, Canada, but is there a big difference between Canada and the States? Well, the, in the, in the U S insurance plays a bigger part than in Canada. So in Canada, we have the public healthcare system and in the U S it's a lot of it is dependent on what level of Medicare, Medicaid you um, qualify for. And also whether you have, other health insurance plans that cover home care. Um, so those are the main differences between Canada and the U.S. Got it. Got it. So tell us, um, tell us a little bit about uh, if, if, if a family caregiver is looking to hire a professional caregiver to help them, which yeah. at some point we, we have to do. <laughs> yeah. uh, if we do caregiving for enough time, so we need some help somewhere sometime. Um, what, what's some of your best advice that you can give people in terms of hiring caregivers, some of your tips or 
yeah. or tricks or guides or what, what, what can you, what advice can you give us? Yeah. Um, so I can talk about where to find the home care, um, mm -hmm. where to find the caregivers and then some things to look out for. So yeah. one thing I want to start off by saying is, um, my approach in looking at the candidates that we recruit and vet, and, and this is my best piece of advice, I think attitude is worth way more than experience because yeah. a lot of things can be learned. And when I pick for both my businesses, when I pick my staff, and I think this is true uh, across many industries, and I would suggest if all of you who are listening to this, if you're interviewing caregivers yourself, that you consider personality and attitude as equally important or even more important than experience because a lot of home care tasks can be learned, but you can't really change someone's attitude or personality very easily, right? And so um, I think that's a really key thing to look out for. Um, in terms of- um, I'm just typing said this that. in the chat because that is such okay. good advice. I'm typing yeah. it in the chat so people can read it. Yeah, attitude, attitude is more important than experience. Yes, in my view. Um, and of course, there's certain aspects of experience that you want to hone in on. So I'm going to get to that in a minute when we talk about like what kind of interview questions you should ask and what mm -hmm. you should look for. But I, I like a person with a great attitude. Um, but in how, terms of, how do you see yeah. that? Like when you when you meet someone, um, yeah. how, how do you hone in on that? So um, there's a few ways that you can kind of hone in on attitude. You can't usually spot it in a resume, right? So you have right. to meet them right. and um, do an interview. And then you get a sense of their communication style, mm -hmm. their tone. Like you can tell a lot in people's tone of language and, and how they answer questions. And so, yeah. um, you know, you could ask really standard interview questions, but then um, people will answer it in very different ways. So I look at mm -hmm. personality, um, how they communicate. I try to ask them about, um, tell me a little bit about um, some difficult situations you've encountered in the past with home care clients and how you would go about um, addressing those challenges. In our recruiting, we actually do an aptitude test. Oh, really? Yeah, we designed an aptitude test based wow. on some common home care scenarios that I see regularly. And there's usually a challenge or a dilemma or a problem. Mm -hmm. And I wanna see how they answer the question on how they would handle that situation. Um, and so that's how I try to get a sense of their attitude. Um, I like that, I really like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can tell a lot with an interview and I um, really encourage people to do in-person interviews if they can. Yeah. If they cannot do live in person, then Zoom um, or some sort of video yeah. um, d uh, channel rather than just a phone call. Wow. And so in terms of um, in terms of interviewing, so like what did you want to say, like tell us some of the questions, was it questions you wanted to help us with or yeah. things, to, things to look out for? What was yeah, I can um, go over kind of um, kind of some top five to 10 things to look out for. Um, normally, if you're looking to hire a caregiver and you're not using an intermediary, but let's say you're going about it on your own, mm -hmm. you would see a resume at the first instance. Mm -hmm. And so in the resume, you want to look for where they've worked, obviously, some obvious things. What are their qualifications? Mm -hmm. Where have they worked? How many years of experience they have? Um, and it'll be easy to weed out the people that don't really qualify and then you'll have a short list. Mm -hmm. um, then you'll proceed to your interview and then you ask a lot more subjective questions as you know, I ask, why did you leave your prior job? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's tell cool. me, Yeah, tell me what happened. Um, some practical considerations are looking at where the, the um, person is coming from, generally where they live. Um, people who have to commute a long way to get to the client, um, often there'll be times such as weather, traffic that will um, make them late on certain occasions. And it, it's just easier to hire someone that is closer to you geographically. 
So yeah. I, I look at distance of commute. And most people don't like to commute a long way anyway, because it's not right. paid. Right. Their commute time is uh, unpaid. Um, as I mentioned, I ask about, you know, tell me about your past jobs, situations you've encountered. Um, Keep in mind that also it's equally an opportunity for them to decide whether they want the job. I was just thinking that. <laughs> because um, a lot of people go into the interview thinking only kind of one way, like, mm -hmm. okay, is this person right for me? They're going to work for me. They don't realize that this caregiver has choice these days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's such a shortage of home care workers that they really, and, and they, I, I've, we've seen this, they've gotten increasingly picky. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. about like the you, jobs that will take they'll take yeah yeah do you like do you ask them like what type of clients do you like to work with or what type of clients do you enjoy working with do, do you ask them that yeah. we do we yeah. do and what we do even more specifically is many of them and this comes out during the interview they want to know more about the client in terms of their everyday routine yeah. because they want to get a sense of what their um shift or their visit will look like mm -hmm. what are the main tasks that they have to help with what kind of personal care needs or help with this, um, activities of daily living um, will they be involved in because they they want to get a sense of how heavy the care is yeah 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 um, another thing to ask for is um, usually when you're at the point of wanting to hire a caregiver the care recipient usually has some sort of chronic condition, could mm -hmm. be Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cancer, arthritis, but some chronic condition that is the um, making it um, necessary for them to get help. Mm -hmm. So most families want a caregiver who is familiar with that particular condition. Right, right. So I would ask, you know, do you have experience working with people who have such and such? Mm hmm um, and then I would get them to talk about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, post interview, you want to do a few things. Um, we always do job reference checks. We do at least two. Mm -hmm. And so I really like to talk to their past employers to, um, and I have questions I ask of them to get a sense of how they performed in their past jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and then a criminal background check is mm -hmm. absolutely necessary. Right, right. Yeah, I remember you're reminding me when I worked in Sunrise Assisted Living 25 years ago, I was the head of the Alzheimer's unit. And one of my jobs was I was responsible for hiring and firing staff. And we conducted weekly interviews because we always needed, it was a hundred bed um, facility and I was the head of the 25 bed Alzheimer's unit. We were always doing interviews because we always needed staff. It's like, and that's, I don't know, maybe that's harder than home care, I'm not sure. Like in a way, because you need a lot of staff for each floor instead of like one person for each home, you know? I don't know, maybe it's not harder, but um, uh, in those days it was quite challenging to keep staff because, you know, they're hard jobs. Yeah, they're hard jobs and staff burnout too. Yeah. And so um, as an employer of a caregiver, just keep in mind, like we find the best relationships between family and caregivers, the ones where the family treat the caregivers really well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's um, so important. Yeah, it, it is really important because it is a partnership. Think of it like a partnership. Don't think about it as they're there to do whatever you say. It, they have to be treated well. Mm -hmm. So as part of your um, business, do you do you train the caregivers in dementia care or specific care? And do you, do you work at, with the families? Like, do you tell the families what to expect or what's reasonable, you know, in terms of like what you were just saying, taking good care of the worker? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, with the families, we have a whole onboarding process. And so we, okay. um, and we help actually, we help them develop the care plan as well if they oh, need good. that help. Um, and so we provide a lot of customer support. Um, in connection with the placement of that caregiver. So we take care of all the matching. Mm -hmm. Prior to the care recipient's family interviewing all the candidates, we would have vetted them. So we take them through and interview the job reference checks, the aptitude test, the criminal background check. That all happens before the client even meets the caregivers. Wow. And then they can choose um, whichever candidate they like. So our model really promotes client having choice. In respect of caregiver training, um, we've partnered with 
a leading caregiver training institute in the US, actually. Mm -hmm. When I benchmark what was available in North America, the best caregiver training in terms of professional education was in the US. And so we partner with them. They provide um, their online training programs and we offer it to our caregivers and we pass it at through at like near cost. We don't try to make wow. money off of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what, what advice can you give to um, other, any other advice you could give to the family? Um, how do they know if this, this, you know, if this caregiver is right for them, how, um, is there anything they can do, ask, say, or notice that might give them a clue as to whether it's the right yeah. relationship, the right partnership? Sometimes you just have to um, let things play out. I would yeah. recommend some trial shifts. I also recommend a probation period. And that gives kind of the caregiver a, a notice or a message that we're just trying you out. We're going to see if this works. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a long term commitment. And it's equally um, to allow the caregiver to see if they want the job and also more so for the senior to see if they feel comfortable with Mm -hmm. the caregiver. And so through those trial shifts, if you set the probation period to be, let's say a week or two weeks, depending on the frequency of visits, generally in a week or two, both parties can figure out, they get a good sense of whether this is gonna work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, That's good advice, that's good advice. And, um, and if it's not a good fit and it doesn't work, um, what do you, do you suggest people just to move on and look for someone else? Yeah, um, definitely. So um, if it's not working out and you've given performance feedback, I always recommend, you know, try to make it work because you've, yeah. there was a reason you like this person to begin with, right? You interviewed them, mm-hmm. you really like them. Um, the first meeting with the senior went well. Um, so I always say, you know, if you have hiccups, just communicate with the caregiver and try to make it work. Just like any business, right? You wouldn't fire an employee the minute there's a right. problem. You try to make it work. Um, but in the end, if it does really end up that you really want someone different, then, you know, there are no long term commitments in senior care. Mm-hmm. Um, most people just expect a reasonable amount of notice. So if they've worked for you under a year um, in Canada, at least you can give, you know, a week's notice and then you look and and look for someone else. And generally, you know, you want to look for someone else before you give notice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Actually, there's a question in the chat that I wanted, I'm going to share. Libby's asking, um, what do you think about online support groups? I'm assuming you mean for caregivers, for either spouses or family caregivers, online support groups. Um, obviously that's a little different than bringing, you know, it's not bringing a caregiver in the home, but what do you, I'm, I'm assuming that can be, I mean, I go ahead, you answer first, then I'll say. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a big supporter of carege- family caregivers getting support from a number of places, whether it's the medical community, professional advisors, caregiver coaches, uh, experts like you and I, um, and also online support groups. I think there is a lot to learn from your peers and other family caregivers who have gone through similar experiences as you. And what I think it, what I see in many clients that we work with is family caregiving in one sense, it's very isolating. Yeah. Because you are um, so involved in helping your loved one. Generally, family caregivers put themselves last. Yeah. So self-care is a whole other topic we could talk on forever yeah. about. But um, even though it's isolating, I promise you there is someone out there who has gone through something yep. similar. Yep. So you're, not, you're actually not alone. And so how great would it be if you could actually find someone who has gone through what you've, you're going through now or on the other end of it and kind of can help you through the process? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and now with Zoom, there is so much available online. You don't even have to leave your house anymore to get the support. Now it's, it's always, the, the in-person ones are always great. And it sometimes it's good to leave your house because you need that break, right? You need to get out. 
But um, if either if you can't find one locally or you can't get out or it's not a convenient time, there's so much available online with Zoom and with COVID. These one of the thing, good things that came out of COVID is a lot more is available online. And, you know, someone could be in Canada and they could join a support group in New Zealand. And, you know, it can be all exactly. over the world. <laughs> Um, and I recommend if you can find support groups that are specific to um, yes. the condition mm -hmm. that you're caring for, because a lot of questions that might pop yeah. up where you want input on are going to be practical questions around mm -hmm. how to deal with a particular symptom or behavior. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. Um, I also wanted to, as you were talking for about coaches and stuff, I thought of this, my client who's from Canada, she actually passed away, but she had told me about a dementia coach and I had never heard of a dementia coach. I imagine now they have them in the US, but it was basically someone that I think she used to come to her every week, maybe twice a week. And she, this woman knew she had a diagnos diagnosis of dementia and she was struggling with a lot of physical and cognitive you know, issues. Um, she had been through a lot, including cancer and, and now she was diagnosed with dementia. And and I don't know where this coach came from. I don't know if it was a government thing. Maybe, you know, basically someone who came and was like coaching her through the process of living with dementia. And that was like a new concept to me. I never heard of that before. Yeah, there's one in Vancouver. Um, these um, coaches are um, few and far between. I think it's an underserved niche. I think we could use more of them, but yes, I have heard of them. Okay, good. I think they're great. Um, they are not covered in Canada through our healthcare system. So it's all private okay, pay. It's private. Okay. I wasn't sure. Absolutely. Yeah. It's private pay in Canada. Um, but I think it can be really useful. And is this a new concept or this is something that's been around for a while? Well, I think because it's one of those things where it's not necessarily new, but there are so few, few people oh. doing it. Okay. That and the, maybe they're busy enough that they don't need to market widely. Right. That I, it doesn't surprise me that people haven't heard of it. Yeah, for me, it was like it was. I thought it was such a brilliant idea, and um, and and this woman was really benefiting from this coach. She was finding her very supportive and helpful, um, and she was working directly with the person that had dementia. I mean, maybe she also worked with the spouse. I don't. I, I'm not even sure. Right. But I remember her telling me how wonderful she was. Um, yeah. That, that's, a, that's a new concept. I wanted, I wanted to share that idea I had heard. And it was actually specifically from someone in Canada. Um, okay, what else? What, any, other, um, any, any other information or advice you want to share with us? Well, let's talk a little bit about where people can find yes. home care. Yes. Um, so I think for any service, any personal service that's high touch, I think the best is word of mouth. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you don't need to have an intermediary, um, if you know, if you have a neighbor, a friend, a family member who's had a caregiver, and they can vouch for that person, and you know they know that this caregiver has extra time, go for it because word of mouth and someone who has worked with that caregiver is is worth a lot. Then you know you're not hiring someone just new. But aside from word of mouth, um, generally in North America, there's a few different places to go. Um, depending on where you live, there may be nonprofit organizations yeah. that offer home care, and generally it's at reasonable rates. Um, and also, depending on where you live, there might be government funded home care. So, in Canada, we have a government funded home health system, mm -hmm. and we have community care workers who go into um, people's homes. Now, anything that's government funded, at least in Canada, comes with limitations. Okay. And um, because it comes at a hugely discounted cost. Uh -huh. um, and in some provinces, it's actually free. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and so with that comes limitations on visit duration. So it's mm -hmm. usually less than an hour. Mm -hmm. And also limitations in scope. So it's only for medications and personal care. Uh -huh. Not for house chores, not for companionship, not to take you to appointments and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the drawbacks of the public health system is that when I look at the typical client going through the normal continuum of aging, um, there's a lot that people generally need help with before they need help with, say, a shower. Mm -hmm. You don't go from, typically, you don't go from zero care to suddenly needing help with a shower. Mm -hmm. um, the normal aging process people I see go through is they generally need help with uh, house chores, cleaning, laundry, 
um, home maintenance, uh, maybe they stop driving and they need mm -hmm. help with getting, you know, groceries or to appointments um, and meal preparation. They mm -hmm. stop cooking for themselves. So those are the things I actually see more common um, before someone needs personal care or mm -hmm. before someone is forgetting to take their meds. Um, so for those things, you have to hire, go privately. And mm -hmm. so through private pay channels, you can go through home care agencies, of which there are many. It's a very mature industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's lots of large home care agencies in the U.S. and Canada, mostly they're franchise chains. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are some that are kind of local to your city, but many of them are franchised. Mm -hmm. um, or if you want to hire someone privately and directly, there are platforms like ours. Mm -hmm. There are other placement agencies where what, rather than the agency employing them, you're employing them, but through an intermediary that has vetted them. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of that often is that the caregiver earns more um, as an hourly wage and mm -hmm. you have more of a direct relationship um, after that caregiver is placed, they work for you. So it's it's a little bit like when families hire a nanny. Mm -hmm. That nanny is kind of your nanny. They work for you directly. The agency is not going to pull them and send different people every day. Uh -huh. Yeah. So those are the options. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm curious if you've had, um, what's the longest relations, like longest term uh, caregiver you've had by someone? Oh, it can be years. years um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. My care base, my, my, this business has only been in place for um, about three and a half years, but mm -hmm. um, we've had um, relationships go over three years. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And it's really a testament to kind of the whole goal mm -hmm. of um, home care, which is to keep them at home safely for yeah. as long as possible to prolong a move into long-term care. Yeah. 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 Um, wow. Amazing. So you're really helping people stay at home. You're helping, you know, the, the call it the client or patient with dementia, stay at home or with any chronic disease. Um, and you're helping the family cope with the caregiving piece and taking care. Um, yeah. so it's a really, it's a really important role that, um, just back to that. Let's talk for caregiver burnout for one second. Cause we yeah. started that, um, caregiver burnout, you have any good tips or advice for people that are really feeling burnt out other than hiring a caregiver, which is what we're talking yeah. about. But other than that, you have any good advice? Well, these, it's not novel advice. Cause I think people listening to this recording or who are on live may have heard this from other places, but share the care. Don't feel like it's all your responsibility. I think, um, and don't put yourself last, like put, set some boundaries around what you're willing to do and not willing to do or the time that you're willing to spend or not spend. And don't feel guilty about the boundaries that you're setting um, because it doesn't help anybody if you burn out. It's kind of like what they tell you on the plane, um, put yep. on your own oxygen mask before helping others. Same goes for caregiving and self-care. Like we said before, like we could talk an hour about different ways of self-care, but yeah. sharing the care, getting I like that. Share the care. I put, I, I yeah. wrote that. I love Great. that. Share the care. Yeah. Um, getting experts involved. Um, talking to other experts. So I'm working with the family right now, for example, who are having a really difficult time with mom or dad, mm -hmm. but they haven't really talked to anybody to get any mm -hmm. experts opinion. So um, in addition to getting my opinion, I've asked them to go talk to a lawyer because there's some mm -hmm. issues with a power of attorney and healthcare rep agreement. Um, I've asked them to talk to their family doctor mm -hmm. um, to get him involved in, because a lot of seniors will listen to their doctor more than they will their own yeah. family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and be proactive. So overall, try to make changes before it becomes necessary. Mm. Even if it's just doing research and having a conversation, because when you are proactive, that is when you have the widest range of options available with respect to any kind of decision. But if you don't plan and something happens and you need to quickly make a decision, it's gonna feel like a crisis. 
That is such good advice. It is such, such wise advice, but it is so hard for people to do that. It is so hard not to wait till crisis to make the change. We all tend to do that, right? We tend to wait till the doctor says you must lose weight or else, right? Or we wait till, you know, the doctor says stop smoking or you're gonna die. You know, like we wait till crisis. Um, And especially with caregiving, it's hard. People are overloaded. It's so hard to make those changes. But what you're saying is so smart and it really could help people like feel calmer and have more serenity um, and put things into place earlier rather than later. Um, it's just hard. People don't want to face it. I think there's a lot of denial. There's a lot of confusion about well, what, what are the right changes that we need to make, right? So there, there's, there's a lot of questions um, as people age. And that's why there are a lot of professionals in the field of aging. <laughs> Yeah. And there's a lot of resistance. I mean, we, I yeah. feel like we could even talk a whole hour about helping yeah. family members deal with resistance. Mm. And I think that is um, one big reason that home care gets delayed yeah. and it it's it starts too late is because the person receiving the care is in denial or is resistant. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, 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 that that is a topic. I, I deal with resistance all the time. <laughs> um, that's a good topic. We should do that next time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my overall um, my overall advice for resistance is you know take baby steps. Yeah, 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 baby steps rather than wholesale changes. Yeah, yeah, uh, that that's good advice because it's too overwhelming otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and do it in a way where. You, if easier said than done, but if you can make it seem like it's their decision, even yes. better. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Pearls of wisdom <laughs> <laughs> from experience and um, good attitude. I like, I still like that line attitude when we're looking for caregivers attitude um, over experience. I like that. Yeah, I, I really think so. Um, I actually found that I found that to be true. And I, now that I'm thinking about it, um, you know, like you said, you can teach people skills. You can teach people what to do in this situation or that situation. But if you come in with like really positive energy and care, genuine care and concern and loving, you know, a loving, loving way of working with people that you can't really, that's hard to teach people. Yeah. But the skills and the technical, how you do this and, and when to do this and what to say, and even dealing with difficult behaviors, we can really, we can train, we can do a lot of training and teaching. But you're right, the attitude, the energy, the vibe, the passion to care for older people, like that is, comes from within, you know? Yeah. And, um, and, and that's the important part. So um, that was, I, I really, I like that. I also like what you said about share the care. I think that's important. We don't have to do it all ourselves. We think we have to, but we don't. <laughs> right. Um, and don't put and, yourself last. And, and don't put yourself last. Make sure to take good care of yourself so that you have the energy to take care of that person. Like if you don't sleep and you don't eat, you're not going to have the energy to do it. Right. And it's just going to build up so much resentment and, and ill health for you. So no one wins. Yeah. Um, so I want to say also that we really, you know, we, we validate, applaud and admire all the hardworking caregivers, whether it's a child or a spouse, a more grandchild or, you know, a sibling, whoever's doing the care. Um, we recognize how hard that is. And that's where Stephanie comes in to just really um, help people make their lives easier. Um, So Stephanie, you're doing amazing work and I want to applaud that. And tell tell us, how can people reach you or where can we find out more about what you do? So the best way is email. I'm pretty responsive on email. And so um, it's stephanie at mycarebase.com. But if you can put it in the episode um, details, that'd be great. Um, And we're in, although we're in greater Vancouver and greater Toronto, no matter where you live, what we've done for people outside of those two cities who come to us is we can do custom recruitment. So we might not have an existing roster already in place in the city where you live, but I can be kind of your family's personal recruiter Um, because no matter what city you live in, the mechanics of recruiting, vetting, and shortlisting caregivers is the same. Mm -hmm. So I look for a lot of the same things that I spoke about earlier, and that goes um, across all cities. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, that was a question I was also thinking to ask you, which was, what do you do about people that are not close to you? So, you, I mean, or I'm saying, do you, have you help 
people all over. Will you answer that? Okay. And I just put your email, Stephanie at mycarebase.com. I just put that in the, um, in the comments right under this video. This video will stay in the Facebook group. People can go in and watch it whenever they want. The replay will be there. Um, if you're watching the replay, please write hashtag replay so we know you watched it. And if you have any questions, put them in here and me or Stephanie will go in and answer. And Stephanie, I want to thank you so much for sharing this advice, this wisdom, and for doing the amazing work that you do. And I look forward to collaborating with you. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks so much for having me today. It was a great chat. My pleasure. Hang on. I'm going to stop the recording and stop the one second. Hold on.